Very powerful, both of you. Um, I am, before we um, close, going to make a very short response to your joint statement. But I want us to have a chance to discuss your very disturbing talks before um, I do so. <clears throat> and there's a way in which they both took me back to the, um, the beginning of this conference when I asked the qui bono question, who profits from Holocaust distortion, Holocaust instrumentalization, etc. Now, Cossack has just given us <laughs> a very simple explanation. Yeah, three hundred billion dollars, maybe. Okay, so that's a, you know, um, that's uh, a powerful reason to, uh, you know, want to distort the Holocaust. But I want to ask if we can talk about slightly more complicated problems. Kosick, you used the word responsibility several times. And um, of course, the entire German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, Erinnerungskultur, Historiker Streit, all of the things that fall under that, have been an attempt to take responsibility after a generation that wanted to deny any. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I certainly understand that one motivation is to refuse responsibility. I also wonder about the kind of things that Yelena Subotic were was talking about in her uh, in her talk, namely, I mean, obviously, Jan, you were talking about um, political interests at work here and uh, undemocratic forces. To what extent are we dealing with an attempt to uh, blacken communism so much that no one will ever try anything resembling it again? Um, let me stop there and ask each of you to respond, because I really am, uh, I was fascinated by both of your talks, but I'm also trying to ask where this comes from, except in the obvious sense. Well, does it didn't work? Yeah, that does work. Um, you know, perhaps I will start very briefly uh, with my, um, with my, uh, failed expedition to the German heart of darkness. Um, uh, I was, uh, two years ago, I was uh, a fellow at the Institut für Zeitgeschichte, uh, and uh, in the course of my um, travels to Germany, I became aware more of the uh, Rineon's Kultur, which I was not aware of so much before. And uh, I read in May of uh, 2020, um, a German uh, then uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, I think his name was Mr. Heiko Maas, um, uh, wrote together with Professor Wirsching, who was the chief, or is the chief of uh, uh, Mun Mun Munich Institute of uh, Zeitgeschichte, they wrote a short, short text in which they said that 100% uh, of guilt for the Holocaust goes to Germany, 100%, and whoever dares to put to question uh, this statement is an enemy of free Europe uh, and is uh, not uh, uh, right. Mm, well, uh, I understood that these are good Germans, Anständige uh, Deutsche, who want to do good thing. And uh, they had in their um, eyesight probably AFD and so on and so forth. Uh, however, when speaking of Holocaust, one has to keep one's horizon broad. So I wrote an article uh, about uh, basically um, suggesting that, look, uh, Germans, I, we appreciate your efforts. It's, uh, they are enormous. Uh, but leave, you know, a few percent here and there for us all, uh, for us uh, French people and Dutch people and Polish people and uh, Lithuanians. You know, we would love to be able to come to terms with our own history. Uh, so, you know, you will, there is enough of guilt to go around. Leave us a few percentage points here so we could come to terms with them. Uh, 
the answer was uh, dead silence. I was unable to publish it anywhere in Germany. I sent it to e every possible publication. And finally, lo and behold, I published it in English in Haaretz in Israel, which of course made no sense at all. Um, uh, but, uh, but this was my, my, uh, my attempt to reconcile Polish, or perhaps my Polish point, Polish Jewish point of view on responsibility with the German um, over enthusiastic attempt to claim the. So here, what you have on the one hand, you have this desire to claim, on the other, you have an absolute stonewall of refusal because, on the flip side, each and every time when good Germans claim 100% responsibility, they provide ammunition to bad people in other countries who are using them in order to as Moraviecki said, you know, the guilt is entirely on the German. We are like a pure, white, undriven snow. So this is about your question about responsibility. Um, well, I, I agree with you, but as a footnote, first, Germany did it. That is, without Germany, this would not have happened. In this sense, Germany bears 100% of the responsibility. Second, Germany did it. They admitted we're off the hook. And third, Germany did it, not content to murder the Jews. Germany is now trying to show us how we should remember them. And this slightly is too much. Now, the problem is, of course, that this gives an extraordinary alibi for scoundrels to not admit to their own guilt by now responsibility no more living perpetrators. But there was this extraordinary debate in Polish parliament when we still had a parliament that was a parliament, um, when the Institute of National Remembrance presented its report on the Yedwabne massacre that I had mentioned earlier, which confirmed um, what Jan Gross had written, that this was a murder committed by Polish neighbors against Jewish neighbors at German instigation, to be sure, but no German participated. And um, the head of the institute, Professor Leon Kieres, was viciously attacked in parliament by right-wing MPs who accused him very predictably of treason, slandering Poland, having sold out to German interests and whatever. And Kieres listened to that very, very calmly and then answered his chief detractor Sir, I will not be denied my right to feel shame. And in this sense, yes, there is enough responsibility to go around that we are not depriving the Germans anything if we claim our part of it. That's an extraordinary story that you told Jan about not being able to get the piece published anywhere but Haaretz. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be surprised because um, many of us here in this room have had uh, experience with things not being published that we thought would be of interest but were just slightly contrary to the orthodox position. Let me ask a utopian counterfactual. What do you think would happen um, if it were possible in all of these countries where there were serious collaborators? What do you, th well, first of all, the question is what would happen if they took responsibility, if some of the countries took responsibility? And secondly, how utopian is that fantasy? Could anything make it happen? <clears throat> okay, well, um... The problem is that I would say at certain stage in the, in the past, perhaps it was possible, uh, where people wanted still to wipe the slate clean. There were perhaps moments like this. Um, however, I think this moment is gone and we are moving into a new orthodoxy. We are moving into this age of alleged innocence, which is being reinforced. And as a historian, I am very fearful of what I see, because what happens, I'm using Poland as an example, but you can substitute Poland for Hungary, Romania, uh, to Lithuania, definitely. Uh, you have this uh, concerted effort to, uh, to create something that Yehuda Bauer calls uh, usable history. 
usable history which uh, is uh, which is not uh, factual but it's very easily digestible uh, it is tasty and uh, the problem is that uh, as we know as everybody knows for propaganda to be successful it has to taste well. Um, uh, in my uh, childhood uh, and uh, adult years, I was uh, a child educated and then a young man educated within the communist school system, just as uh, Costa Gebert was, but we knew obviously that the lies told to us were un palatable, they were rejected uh, immediately. Um, now this what the populists and nationalists sell is a, um, we can say, a sort of an empty, uh, unhealthy food, but it goes down well. Uh, and this is my fear that, uh, uh, that these statistics that we both quoted uh, uh, about this vast popularity of lies in a public sphere, that it's something that will take root uh, because it's something that tastes so well, uh, praising, praising your uh, nobility and morality of, of previous generations. So I am very, as a historian, I'm very fearful of this. Especially as this ties into a broader problem. This is not only about responsibility for the Shoah. It's about you have your facts, we have our facts. There is no longer the belief that there actually is a way of reaching the truth. We see it in the pseudo debates about the Shoah, but we see them in debates about everyday politics. Um, not only in Poland, but throughout the democratic world. So if there is to be a moment of, well, Hezbon Hanefesh, an accounting of the soul, it should be done not only because we owe it to the victims, but um, as Ksenia Svietwova said about peace with the Palestinians, we owe it ourselves. If we continue to tolerate comfortable falsehoods, we'll probably all die because somebody will convince us that, um, I don't know, vaccination in general is, is bad for your health. And we shouldn't, right? I mean, there was an age when people didn't vaccinate and median age was 30. And child mortality was 40% and higher. We could still return to that. It's not only about the Shah. And unless the principle that, no, actually there are facts apart from your facts and your facts, they're just facts. If we don't return to that, we're done for. I want to ask you one more question before I turn to the audience, but um, you should all know that it's time to start lining up. It's a very big question, um, I realize that, but it's something that's run through uh, a lot of the discussions we've been having. Caustic, I remember you giving a wonderful talk at a conference we did at the Einstein Forum on victims. Um, there is, in the last, I think it started around the middle of the last century, there's been an astonishing historical change in the question of who is the subject of history. Uh, I think it was Gilbert Ashka who in another context said yesterday, you know, certain things are really important to, to correct, but then there's sometimes an overcorrection. We um, ignored victims for many, many years, um, but the sort of victimhood competition is clearly playing a role in the Polish and in other cases. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Look, essentially, historically, nobody wanted to be a victim because a victim is defeated and probably dead. It's not exactly the most attractive future to think of. But what happened with democracy developing a conscience, being a victim gives you automatically the moral high ground. And this is nonsense. The fact that somebody suffers doesn't make him a better person. This is simply a Christian fallacy. The idea of um, 
the improvement of the moral status of an individual or of a society through suffering. Now, I know people who've gone through suffered and emerged noble, but my suspicion is that they might have emerged noble even without the suffering. <laughs> but collectively, suffering does not ennoble. Suffering makes you callous and indifferent to the suffering of others because you concentrate on your own pain. Happened to the Jews, happened to the Poles, happened to the Kurds. I can't, I mean, the list is long. I don't see anybody who managed to avoid the trap. Therefore, regardless of the short-term benefits of being a victim, if you can avoid it, not only because being a victim usually hurts, but also because it makes you morally dumb. Incidentally enough, um, Jeanne Marie, um, said, who survived Auschwitz, said exactly the same thing. Uh, in fact, he was against there even being monuments to the Holocaust, because he said being a victim is not, uh, it, it's not an achievement. Right. On the other hand, we are not. We are talking here about very specific victims. We are talking here about the victims of the Holocaust, to which certain ethnic groups or nations want to come close to. And this is not the question of sharing the pain. It's the sharing the gain, rather, and the gain being the high moral ground without the associated suffering, of course. And so, in case of Poland, it's very interesting that. Very very often you can today open textbooks and you will find a lie which originated in 1945. The lie is called three million and three million. Uh, 1945, mind you, um, uh, when after the war, uh, the um, so-called physical losses in Poland have been summed up. Uh, the three mil Jewish figure of three million was uncontested because simply no one was left alive, let's say, with the exception of 20 few thousand that, uh, that Kostek mentioned before, um, uh, before the uh, Jews saved in the Soviet Union started to trickle back uh, to Poland for a moment. And, uh, so um, uh, what uh, the Polish authorities did, they started, they organized a special office um, of uh, wartime losses, which uh, summed up and came with, in 1945, uh, with a rough number of 1.8 million Polish ethnic deaths, which sounds very respectable. However, it was deemed absolutely insufficient. Hence, uh, hence uh, Polish chief of, uh, chief of uh, secret service said, uh, of security said, that, okay, let's do it three million and three million. So, I mean, this is an old thing, and uh, you measure up to the ideal victim. It's, uh, God forbid, that you would like to uh, assume uh, the pain. You want to assume the gain. Um, if it's quick, because yeah. there are people lining up. Um, the real problem in, in victims is that there is a competition. Um, the mayor of Nagasaki once famously said that there's just one thing worse than being the first city to be A-bombed, that's being the second city. Everybody remembers Hiroshima. And then there was Naga something. Nobody wants to be Naga something. And therefore, in order to avoid being Naga something, we have to prove not only that we are Hiroshima, but in fact that Hiroshima is Naga something. And this unavoidably corrupts the way that you described it. There's so much of this fake history written in the hope that we might turn out to be Hiroshima after all. Hey, Emily Disha Becker is standing in the light. Oh, we don't identify the other questioners, but I'm happy to be identified. Hi, thank you both. Um, I have two questions for both of you, um, brief ones. Um, so I understood a little bit why um, German Erinnerungs or Aufarbeitung, you know, doesn't want to share the guilt pie. But um, I was wondering whether you have um, any idea why we also don't hear about contemporary Polish anti-Semitism and revisionism much in, in Germany or in the German press. Um, and I don't think that the, I mean, I think there is, um, a good um, 
case to be made that externalization of blame for contemporary anti-Semitism is popular. We hear a lot about Muslim anti-Semitism, Palestinian anti-Semitism, and imported anti-Semitism. But even, I mean, there was some sort of horrible demonstration in Eastern Poland, uh, anti-Semitic demonstration a couple of months ago, and it was not at all mentioned in the German press. That was my first question. The second question, very brief, um, do you have any idea why the IRA working definition is so popular among post-communist Eastern European states. I think 14 out of the 35 members of the IRA are um, from, from, from that. Thank you. Uh, I'll respond to the first part, perhaps. I'm less, uh, less in, introduced to the second one. And, uh, you know, um, there is this uh, a very... I'm talking about my own professional guild, historians. Uh, there is a very strong sentiment among my, fr my German colleagues um, that... Uh, discussing uh, Polish or any other um, uh, Eastern anti-Semitism actually is uh, playing into the hands of a German uh, right wing or uh, simply can be construed as a part of uh, a German sharing the blame. Mm, and it even goes further. It is this extraordinary, um, let's say, I've been often asked by my German colleagues, can we write something about this particular topic? Because I'm German, you know, uh, which I refuse to acknowledge, because if you are, you are a historian, right? Um, you are not, uh, first of all, you are somehow uh, beholden to the to the facts which you describe. Uh, however, uh, to give an example, it goes beyond this. I remember that many several years ago, uh, one of the major German publishing houses asked me for a copy of my book, which I shared with them. Um, and uh, half a year later, lo and behold, they said that the book is good, but unfortunately, I understand why they cannot publish it in German. Um, I said yes, of course, they understood, and that was the end of the discussion. So, so this uh, this uh, this is the same part of the. Of this equation that I found when uh, when trying to publish my article on uh, German and Polish responsibility. Well, Germany is in a trap of its own doing, and I don't see a way out of that trap. Um, Germany committed the Shah, eventually grew a conscience that understood this, and tried to make it good again. Right. The problem is you can't make it good again. I mean, this remains as a wound. It cannot be healed, it cannot be compensated. And it's not that the Germans are not trying enough, even if they're not trying enough. This is not the point. Um, in the early 90s, when the Jews from the former Soviet Union started trickling into Germany and were received royally and granted citizenship and employment and education and apartments and whatever, um, first couple of thousand, wonderful. Um, 20,000, great. When it got into the dozens of thousands, people started asking a legitimate question. How many are we supposed to take in? And there was an, a discussion about that, which was ended by a letter, I believe, to the Frankfurter Allgemeine that said, I believe the moral minimum is six million. Except that if this is the standard, there is no way you can meet it, okay? So obviously, if I'm an editor of a German newspaper and somebody proposes to me um, a, a service on anti-Semitism in Poland, it's as if the New York Times would do, do a brilliant investigative reporting coverage of denial of slavery in Mauritania. I mean, there's something indecent to it, right? And until they find a way out, they being the Germans, a way out of the trap, which would not be cowardly, which would not be denial. And I don't know what is the way, but I didn't murder six million people either. Um, until this doesn't happen, yes, the, the kind of ridiculous trap that you don't get covered in the Semites in Poland, and uh, there are things you cannot say, and will continue. And as to the IRA definition, look, there are worse definitions. It's not a bad definition. It's being badly used. It's not a bad definition. But it costs nothing for Poland to sign up to the IRA definition. And they say, well, you accuse us of anti-Semitism. We signed up to IRA. It's a get out of jail free card. If I was the Polish government, I would use it myself. 
Omri Böhm. No, was, no, oh, I thought I saw Omri first. No, we changed. <coughs> Stephanie Schuler Springorum. Yeah, thank you. I'll be very brief because I think time is running out. I have another question on German politics, and I would like to hear your opinion on that. I'm not sure that ev whether everyone knows that uh, two years ago the German state decided to create or to build a new big document center on the German, uh, on the occupation of Europe, I mean on the occupation regimes all over Europe, including Poland of course, and then uh, uh, on the side, not on the side, but at the same time also a documentary center and monument to the suffering of Poland. So there is a general occupation, there will be a general monument and document center on occupation and a specific Polish one. I would like to hear your opinion on that. Um, I didn't know that there was supposed to be a document center. I thought it was only a monument, but uh, that's, of course, it's revealing. It's not completely clear yet, but okay. I think they said that we cannot have just a monument without explaining why. Okay, so this is, uh, but, but the, the, the separate one is for Poland, I heard, and there was a tremendous pressure. We are talking about politics here, of course, so it uh, demonstrates uh, the, the, I would say, uh, if for Poland, why not for Ukraine, um, why not for Lithuania, uh, it's simply demonstrates demonstrates the, perhaps the, uh, proxy, let's say, strong diplomatic pressure which bears fruit, but I am not privy to any diplomatic secrets. Um, uh, however, the fact that uh, that uh, there is a blemish on the map of uh, Berlin, which is Pilecki Institute office next to Kolfürstendamm, uh, to Bandemogator, uh, is very telling in this context. Jelen Subotic. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief. My question is about museums in Poland. You mentioned, Jan, the situation with the Auschwitz Memorial Museum. I was uh, wondering to what extent you think that state institution has been co-opted for the Polish narrative in terms of highlighting Polish um, uh, victimization in, in their Twitter feed. They, I'm sure you know, profile a, a victim each day and increasingly there are more polls than, than others. And related to that, if you can update us on the situation with the Poland Museum of Polish Jewry uh, after the debacle with the uh, last director and a firing, where is that institution? Will it be co-opted? Is it maintaining its independence? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I can tell a few words about uh, Auschwitz, but I will send over the question about Pauline to, uh, to my colleague. Uh, so about Auschwitz, I became aware when I started to I, I went to Auschwitz and I listened to the guides, what they were speaking. I was very frustrated. Uh, if you go with an English or any other German or French guide, you hear one story. If you go with a Polish guy, something different uh, occurs. Uh, but what really got me going were, were these polls indicating that more and more people in Poland associate uh, Auschwitz with primarily Poles. It becomes slowly a Polish lieu de mémoire. Uh, it is being now surrounded with, there is a new museum of Polish virtue opened, what, a few hundred meters away from the camp just last month. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so I said to myself that if you are, as the director of the museum, Cywiński is, a custodian of memory of the Holocaust, that's basically what Auschwitz is. Um, and you do nothing to counter this uh, wave of historical fallacy which sweeps the nation, then you are guilty of a very serious crime against history. Um, not everyone has to be a director of Auschwitz. If you don't do these things, uh, then that is a serious problem. So I, I became finally attuned to what they do, and I'm increasingly worried. And of course, it's a Polish state museum with everything it entails. Uh, it's a part of this uh, larger, larger so-called history policy uh, set up, uh, and uh, it becomes the more Poland becomes dominated by the nationalists, the more, of course, these museums are in a difficult situation and the less able they are to resist if they want to resist. So I, am, I don't have any let's say, concrete proofs. I can only see either small signs of action on the wrong side or enormous, enormous inaction in the same area. So lack of, uh, lack of action. So here I transfer the voice. Pauline is this extraordinary museum of the history of Polish Jews in Warsaw. Um, it was opened um, barely six years ago, um, and eventually um, the Ministry of Culture, which is one of the co-organizers of the museum, refused to accept the director who won the competition, um, although he was voted for by almost unanimously the jury, including some jurors that were nominated by the ministry itself. Um, long paralysis ensued, and eventually 
the director's deputy got the job, and the museum is in stasis. It cannot really evolve. Um, everybody is waiting for the second shoe to fall. And the second shoe might be a planned museum of the history of the Warsaw Ghetto, a separate museum that the government is spending serious money on, which possibly might be a way to produce the a politically appropriate narrative about um, the history of Jews in Warsaw and therefore Jews in Poland that Pauline Museum lacks. We already had a precedent, the Museum of the History of World War II in Gdańsk, um, another extraordinary museum that the government took over after a legal battle, um, claiming that, as one of the expert opinions they had commissioned stated, the museum gives a too negative perspective on the war. Seriously, I mean, this is a direct quote. Because I said, yeah, I, I saw the museum before the takeover, and yeah, you leave the museum with the feeling that war is a horrible thing and should not try it. But the expert argues, yes, that bad things happen in wars, but good things too. There's patriotism, there's solidarity, there's heroism, and the museum, and guilty as charged, the museum did not play up those good things about war. It now does. So I, we have three last questions. I'm going to put you all together. Mikola is I see, and I don't see who. Yeah, you you can begin, and then Mikola, and then Omri Böhm. Hi, my question is for uh, Jan Krabowski. Could you enlighten maybe those of us who are based here in Berlin a little bit more about this Pilecki Institute? which I think is um, located not on Kurfürstendamm, as you said, but um, at the Brandenburger Tor, um, surrounded by um, embassies and uh, the Academy of the Arts, which is quite a prominent uh, place. How did they make it there? What is their agenda? And thanks as well for voicing your uh, criticism about it, about a year ago on Facebook, I think. I don't see much uh, criticism elsewhere about it. Okay, right away then. Uh, it became, I mean, uh, after they, after they construct, constructed this Maletka monument, Treblinka, uh, I really was uh, hors moi. I was, that was a bit too much even for me. Uh, but uh, the thing is that you have an institution that is being funded this year to the tune of 150 million zlotys, which is about 40, 30 million euros. It is not small change, so they have the money to burn. It's not theirs, it's the state's. Um, and what they do in the heart of Germany is they will corrupt you to an extent, uh, offering certain uh, juicy grants, uh, translation rights, trips to Warsaw. Uh, uh, just uh, this uh, earlier this year, they, uh, they received money from the government to give out prizes in history for the best book in history, um, with 70,000 zloty prize money, which is uh, 20,000 or something euros, um, or less, a bit less. Uh, still, for a humanist, quite a lot of money. Um, hopefully, the American professor awarded declined this, and I would like her example to be an example to our, to us Western scholars when dealing with Pilecki, and her name is uh, Eliana Adler, um, author of a wonderful book on Polish Jews in the Soviet Union during the war. She declined the prize, uh, uh, citing, uh, let's say, reasons of politics and morality. Um, uh, so uh, about um, and uh, what what Pilecki in Berlin does is basically it distorts the history of the Shoah, among other things, producing uh, producing partially true reports, for instance, and the historical evidence from the 1960s and 70s. Now they um, they produce uh, translations of it, which presents uh, Polish wartime history in relation to the Jews in a very rosy light, for instance. But there is much more, but we don't have the time to go over all of this. We don't have the time, and I'm so tired that I forgot I said three questions at once. So please, the two of you, short question. No, um, uh, Mikola, Omri, that's it. And short answers from the two of you. In your dreams. <laughs> uh, um, we are talking about, uh, right now, about the responsibility for, for the 
uh, crime of, Holo of Holocaust of, of genocide uh, and uh, this is a prevention of all the crimes in the future. But I, I would like to remember that some, some genocide is happening right now. Russia is killing people, people in Ukraine. Russia is destroying Ukrainian culture. Russia is stealing Ukrainian children. Uh, and uh, Germany, uh, who uh, recognized the responsibility for, for, for the genocide, for the crimes, refuses right now to, 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 to even to try to stop it. Because it is too, too danger. And Poland, in Lithuania, they are trying to stop it. That my question would be how uh, that, that, that recognizing the responsibility help us to stop it right now, not in the, in the future, right now. That is uh, the question, maybe. Thank you. And Omri? That's um, yet another act that's hard to follow. But the, um, um, thank you very much for two extremely important interventions. I say this because my question is an external one, and it's very important for me to say how important I found both uh, papers on their own terms. Uh, my question is to uh, Constante. Um, two days ago, you asked Peter Beinart an excellent question, I thought. I really thought it was an excellent question. He said he stands for the universal and the recognition of the universal um, right of return of refugees, and you asked him, would you also recognize this right um, of Germans returning to Poland? I thought it was an, an important uh, question, and I thought that his answer was actually um, successful. I thought it was um, a good answer. But I do want to turn now the question back to you. You remarked on the ways in which the refusal to recognize uh, financial responsibility and so forth, reparation, um, uh, participates in the hijacking of memory um, in the hands of the right. Would you recognize the same, or would you make the same claims about Israel's duty to recognize that in relation to the Palestinians, the right of return of the Palestinians, and so forth? If not, why not? And how would that participate in the hijacking of memory um, to the right? No, it's, a, it's not rocket science. Um, there exists a right to property and being Palestinian doesn't deny you this right. And the fact that Israel refuses to consider claims of its Palestinian citizens to property that is at the disposal of the state of Israel is outrageous and cannot be justified. Um, and I, I don't think this is even a question to be, to be raised. It seems to me self-evident. However, this is only part of the picture. Um, there are claims to property by Palestinians who are not citizens of Israel. And there are claims to property by Israelis who were Iraqis, um, Libyans, Moroccans, Egyptians, that are not addressed either. And both sets of claims should be addressed at a peace conference when this horrible conflict is finally over. The difference is that Israel is responsible for the rights of its citizens regardless of ethnicity. And here there is no excuse for the claims of Israeli Palestinians not being addressed. The remaining claims need to be addressed at the peace conference. As to right of return, there is no internationally guaranteed right of return for anyone. Um, what exists It, it, it is not international law. No. No, it is not. General Assembly resolutions are not international law. What it's... Pardon? No, I don't think this is a either-or situation. What the General Assembly said, to quote the resolution, is that those refugees who want to return and live in peace with their neighbors have a right to. The General Assembly did not provide a criterion to assess how to find out who wants to live in peace and who doesn't, which essentially makes the whole idea unworkable. 
But in any case, this is not international law. Security Council resolutions are international law. General Assembly resolutions are not. Okay, wait, wait, wait. No, I'm sorry. We're not having this discussion right now, okay? Um, yeah, ex we, um, yeah, but it's not the subject of this panel. What I'm going to propose is the following, um, particularly since we have to leave the room for half an hour to build the stage for your performance. Yes, if I, I'm about to say something. No, excuse me. I'm about to. No. I'm about to say something. If you'll allow me. We expected dissent in this conference. We welcome it, as I said at the beginning. The organizers of this conference knew that we were going to uh, get dissent, that we, actually, we feared worse, and I don't know what's going to happen afterwards. <laughs> um, I decided to treat that as a compliment. <laughs> we don't agree with everything that was said by every speaker, and we don't always agree with each other, okay? Our goal in this conference was to have an open, reasonable discussion in which people didn't shout at each other, didn't interrupt each other, but actually represented different positions in a civil manner. In German, we talk about Freiräume, which have not existed in this country until this moment. And I am very happy for as many people as want to, to go out on the terrace and discuss this further. Um, we have time constraints, which prevent us from doing it in this room, fairly strict time constraints. But we have plenty of time outside um, to talk about any of the details. And I would like to end uh, besides thanking the staff of the HKV, the Einstein Forum, uh, wait a minute, wait, I'm not done yet, and the um, CDF, Zentrum für Antisemitismusforschung, besides thanking all the people behind the scenes, I'd like to end with a piece of good news that I honestly didn't expect. Um, we just got our first long um, report from the conference, from somebody who was actually here, not uh, taking pot shots from the side. It's in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, one of the two main Uber um, national newspapers. And the headline of the, the piece is, finally a fair discussion. <laughs> Ein faire Diskussion endlich. I think that's a success, and I want to thank all of you for contributing to it with us. But let's first thank Jan and Kostek for their contributions. <laughs>